Hi folks, thanks for stopping in. My name's Bill, and I'm a retired Coast Guard and Merchant Marine veteran, home builder and mayor. Now, I was fortunate as a young man to be able to raise some hell in about 30 different seaports and 35 or 36 countries around the world, and I've accumulated a respectable little list of adventures over that time. And after decades of urging from family and friends, I, I want to start recording a few of the, the better ones uh, before they just fade from memory. And this is chapter two. Now, I am an old sailor, and I do use some salty language, so you've been warned. Now, this story took place in uh, the late spring of 1979, and invol it involves uh, Tony's Dive Shop in the Charleston Boat Basin. Tony's shop was in the building next to the Basin Cafe, uh, where the bait shop is now. And every winter, uh, when business was slow, Tony would offer a free scuba class to uh, anyone at the station who wanted to partake. He'd do all this out of his own pocket, pay for the pool time, uh, had to rent time at the community pool, and of course provide all the equipment. Then after four long pool sessions and uh, three more out in the bay itself, you were Patty, open water certified. And all this would actually cost Tony a few bucks to do every year. Renting the community pool for four evenings and then borrow a boat, buy fuel for the bay dives. And Tony would never take a dollar payment for any of this. It was just something he enjoyed doing for the boat crews. He was just a, a happy, big hearted guy, and everybody loved him. But he wouldn't hesitate to ask if he needed help uh, with a project of some sort, and, and everybody at the station would, would jump at the chance to give Tony a hand on just about anything. But uh, Tony's classes were no cakewalk. He told uh, every class a story of when he was diving in the islands as a, a, a younger man with a tourist group. And one of the group, a young lady, got off by herself in this shallow wreck. And uh, she got hung up on something and, and didn't make it back up. And he said it really affected him. It was just a, a, a disgusting combination of dive crew incompetence and just allowing someone in waters uh, at depths that they had no business being in. And Tony swore he would never be the guy whose name was on the bottom of that girl's dive certificate. So if you made it through one of Tony's classes, you were solid. You knew what you were doing. Now, I got to be pretty good friends with Tony. We'd hang out some, drink beer, play pool, basin tavern, and then he started taking me on some salvage dives and, and repairs uh, with him. I mean, I was a big, strong guy, um, still am, <laughs> who's pretty good under pressure, so he was comfortable uh, with me as a dive partner, and I just enjoyed the hell out of it. Uh, in fact, my dad did some uh, commercial diving when he was a young man, so it was it was always in my blood. I just loved it. And the night dives in the boat basin were really cool. Now, there's a lot of repair and maintenance work uh, to be done on commercial boat bottoms without actually pulling them out of the water. And you usually do all this at night when the basin is calm and quiet. That way you don't have to worry about boat traffic coming in and out of the slips around you or, or someone dropping some sort of gear on your head. You just hang a couple of huge lights over the side and, and uh, you're in your own little world. And the whole idea of underwater welding always fascinated me, and, and I got a chance to do some of that. It's pretty cool. And then there's wrestling a 200-pound brass propeller along the bottom of a 60-foot boat in 20 feet of water with just a couple of come-alongs and a chain hoist to work with. Man, I, I'll never forget this one prop replacement we were doing there in the basement. It was turning into a real cluster bitch we'd managed to work this 200 and some pound lump of brass along the bottom of this boat and then wrestle it gently you know god forbid you drop this thing and it disappears in the silt 20 feet below you but we wrestle this damn thing into a semi-upright position with all the chain hoists and come-alongs uh, to slip it up on the shaft. And we get this stupid thing started about the first half inch or so on the shaft, and then it just sticks. It jams. 
and it won't go any farther, it won't move. I mean, we fiddle, fart, and fuck with this thing for what seems like an hour, just burning through our air, but we just can't get any proper leverage on it to rock it back and forth and do anything, and we can't get a come along on it from any angle that would do us any good to shift it, so we're stuck. <laughs> at one time here, at one point, I'm literally hanging upside down with my feet planted on the bottom of the boat yanking on this hoist chain that's going across at my at my knee level and i'm just going fucking batshit berserk on this chain man pulling rock and swinging anything to budge it just a little bit i mean tony and i'd had enough of this shit show and we were we were going postal on this damn thing then miraculously i hear the satisfying skunk sound of that 200 pound 200 pound brass abomination sliding home on that shaft oh man but at the very same instant i hear this loud <laughs> it sounded like a walrus was having its nuts mulched right next to me and i shoot a look over to my left just in time to see this little poof of red squirt up on the back side of the prop where it's seated home on the shaft and then this little trail of red coming from where the end of one of Tony's fingers used to be. <laughs> now, I'm all big-eyed looking at Tony. He looks at me and does one of these, you know, shakes his head back and forth and oh, this big, you know, this big cloud of bubbles. And then he just shrugs his shoulders, uh, flipped me off with uh, two-thirds of a finger, and, and we got back to work. I mean, after all we'd been through with this thing, we weren't stopping now. I mean, we're almost done. We finally, you know, we, we slip it on the shaft. So we, we finish up with, uh, you know, the lock and nuts keeper pin, all uh, done in this beautifully backlit red mist. Oh, very romantic. <laughs> Yeah, Tony lost about a half inch off the end of his left middle finger on that job. And uh, I mean, I got to tell you one more little Tony story before we get into the golf ball shit. Now, Tony had this horrific band of scarring about three inches wide that wrapped all the way around his, his uh, left forearm. I mean, this thing was nasty. It looked like someone had taken a, a blowtorch and made a slow pass all the way around his arm. I mean, no shit. It was bad. So one time after I met Tony, or not long after I met Tony, I mean, hell, I couldn't help myself. I had to ask him about it. See, in 1977, Tony was 30-something, and I knew he'd served in Vietnam. So, hell, I was expecting, a, you know, a Cambodian torture story or, you know, something war-related. But he just nodded his head, said, yeah, stop by the dive shop next time. I'll tell you all about it. So a couple of days later, I walk in, and uh, Tony's got his flannel sleeves rolled up, showing off his dueling scar. He smiles, jerks his thumb over his shoulder, and says, there he is. That's Fido. That's the son of a bitch that almost took my fucking arm off. And Fido was the biggest, ugliest wolf eel head you've ever seen in your life mounted on an old piece of plywood stuck up on the wall. Now, a wolf eel is one of the ugliest, nastiest creatures God ever placed on this earth. They're actually a bottom fish. Uh, but they get, you know, six to eight feet long and uh, 40 plus pounds with a disproportionately large head and jaws and a seriously bad attitude for good measure. And there's there's something straight out of your worst nightmare, and they're fairly common in the cold waters of the Northwest. And if you're diving or uh, spearfishing for grouper, snapper, bling cod, you know, hell, anything tasty, uh, then you're poking around in the rocks and wolf eel territory. Now, normally this isn't much of a problem. They're they're fairly docile. I mean, they'll they'll leave if they know you're around. But during spawning. <laughs> that's a whole different story now the male and female stay together in their uh, den protecting the egg cluster and are extremely territorial so if you shove your your spear in the wrong hole at the wrong time you could end up with a wolf eel torpedo to the face mask and it has happened and that's what tony was doing at around cape argo 
Fox Rock area. He was spear fishing with his girlfriend, Janice, uh, sticking his spear into strange holes, you know, no pun intended. Uh, when this massive wolf eel launches out of the hole, jaws open straight at Tony's face. Now, of course, your instant reaction is to throw your arm up in front of you, and this thing instinctively chomps down on his forearm. Now, the frightening thing about a wolf eel's jaw is that it works like a ratchet. Once it bites down, it locks to it locks to hang onto its prey, and then it's up to the wolf if and when he decides to release it. You're powerless. Now, at this point, Tony knows he's in deep kimchi. I mean, he's got this alien creature with a head the size of a three-gallon bucket latched on his arm with an eight-foot, 45-pound pissed-off muscle attached to it, and it's doing its damnedest to writhe around and rip his fucking arm off. Now, right now, Tony knows he's got about 20, maybe 30 seconds to figure this shit out, or this thing is going to bash him around and hold him down till he drowns. This is his world. You're in 20 feet of water by yourself with poor visibility. It's not a good situation. Now, the head of this thing is locked on its arm. It's not going anywhere. Tony manages to get his legs wrapped around the body to get some kind of control and gets to his dive knife and just starts stabbing this thing. Now, both Tony and the wolf know that this has turned into a fight to the death. There's only one way this ends. One of them dies. Well, obviously we're telling the golf ball story, so, you know, Tony makes it. now. But now he's staggering, he's staggering out of the surf onto the beach, still dragging this eight-foot thing on his arm, leaving a blood trail like you wouldn't believe. He drops to his knees and just starts sawing at this thing. And can't get the jaws open, so, you know, he has to cut the body off behind the head. At this point, Tony's obviously the center of attention for you know, a handful of people on the beach. His girlfriend, Janice, is freaking out. They're trying to stop the bleeding, but you can't address the actual wound with a bucket-sized alien head still attached to his arm. So they wrap it up the best they can, throw a quick and dirty tourniquet on his arm, and, and run him to the emergency room, Bay Area Hospital. Now, <laughs> of course, the emergency room turns into the whole new circus. Now the nurses are freaking out. Nobody wants to touch this thing. It's a fucking wolf eel. And Tony's yelling not to tear it to pieces. He wants it in one piece. I mean, hell, he just survived another brush with death. He wants his war trophy. So he said they they eventually had maintenance bring up uh, some big bolt cutters and uh, to cut the jaws open and pry this thing off his arm. But all Tony was worried about was saving that head. Man, if that ended up in the garbage, he was going to come back and burn that place to the ground. So they, they wrapped it up, put it in the cafeteria freezer for him, and uh, that's how Fido wound up on Tony's wall in the dive shot. Yeah, that's Tony. So, uh, yeah, now we get to Sunset Bay. Now, the, the, uh, <laughs> the golf ball debacle was actually the, the culmination of a, a long, nasty, personal blood feud between Tony and, uh, well, let's call him Butters, Tony and Butters. Now, all this had been coming to a head for a while. Uh, these two had history, and Tony didn't talk much about the details. It was none of my business. All I knew was that it had something to do with his ex-wife and how Butters treated one of Tony's kids. And that's all I needed. That's all I needed to know. I mean, Tony was my friend, and Butters was going down. And as it turned out, Butters owned the other dive shop in the area over in Coos Bay. So he and Tony were direct competitors in a small market for salvage and repair work, you know, classes, equipment, sales, everything. Now, remember, it was uh, late spring in 79, uh, I don't know, May, early June, I think, something like that. And I get a call from Tony around noon on a Friday. And I uh, says, are you off tonight? Yeah. Well, good. Meet me at the tavern, 9 o'clock. And wear something dark. Huh? <laughs> yeah, just do it. Click. So, now I'm thinking, well, this doesn't sound like a typical Friday night. 
you know, drink beer, shoot pool, maybe punch somebody. But, uh, you know, Tony's got something cooking. Man, I can't wait to find out what this is. So I'm in my jeans and, and you know, dark blue hoodie as I walk into the tavern at about 10 till 9. And, of course, the watch standard always really is 10 minutes early. And uh, there's Tony standing at the end of the bar in his black boots, black jeans, black sweatshirt, black knit cap, and a big bushy black beard. I mean, he's, <laughs> he is the perfect image of a cartoon burglar and had the biggest shit-gobbling grin you've ever seen on a human being. He was just vibrating with excitement and said, We cram and ordered two beers and two shots. And uh, this is just infectious. I mean, he's got me vibrating now. So we slam the shots, and he slides a newspaper in front of me. It's Coos Bay Herald, open to uh, the local activity section or whatever. And there's this really nice quarter page ad from Butter's Dive Shop advertising an open dive on a Saturday in two weeks inside Sunset Bay, just a couple miles south of Charleston. Any and everybody is invited for drinks and snacks and prizes would be written on golf balls and thrown out in the bay. If you find a golf ball with a prize, it's yours. The local radio station, KWRO, was doing a feed. They're running spots for it. And uh, there'd be some local celebs. I mean, big deal. The point was that, you know, Butters is really putting him, oops, sorry. Butters is really putting himself out there with this. I mean, it was taking a lot of planning and expense to put this thing together. And uh, there's going to be a big hoopla for Butters Dive Shop. But it hasn't clicked with me quite yet. So I'm asking Tony, so what, we're going to take up his invite and go get prizes ourselves? And this two-foot-wide grin answers, no, bigger than that. Come on, we got work to do. So I buy two more quick shots, and, <laughs> and off we go. <clears throat> now, Tony's driving us into Coos Bay. He won't tell me shit. He's just grinning and laughing. This is going to be good. This is going to be so good. We uh, stop on this little road, woods on both sides. He, he hands me a bucket and says, uh, come on, this way. Okay. So <laughs> I'm following a, a very strange man uh, carrying a bucket dressed in all black into the deep, dark woods. Yeah. What could, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Now, into the woods, about 30 yards, maybe, the uh, the woods stop, and we're standing at the fence on the back side of the Coos Bay Country Club's driving range. <laughs> then it hits me like a wet sock full of shit upside the head. Golf balls! <laughs> yep, we hop over and run along the fence line like a couple of big dumb cat burglars, cackling like a couple of drunken schoolgirls dressed in black and each carrying a Home Depot five-gallon bucket. So, uh, yeah, we, we break into the shed where they wash and store the range balls and uh, fill our little buckets. So between the two of us, I mean, we must have 500 golf balls easy. Now, the way these things would normally work is that uh, butters might put up, you know, maybe two or three hundred dollars worth of actual prizes, you know, like a free dive mask, free swims, free snorkel, uh, and then a bunch of discounts on larger purchases, you know, ten dollars off a mask and snorkel combo, uh, twenty dollars off a buoyancy compensator, one free dive lesson, uh, you know, fifty dollars off a family certification course. I mean, you get the idea. And with all the, the food, the activities, newspaper ads, radio spots, I mean, Butters is really putting himself out there for all this, and it's costing him a penny. So we figure, hell, the least we could do is help a fellow dive operator make a big splash in the community, right? <laughs> yeah, we're just doing our civic duty, helping out a fellow small business owner. So, <laughs> excuse me. So Tony and I spend the next week when I wasn't on watch with our Sharpies and 500 golf balls. Dive mask and snorkel, your choice. Normally, I don't know, 60 bucks. Oh, probably 40 of those. Swim fins, your choice. Again, yeah, 60 bucks. Yeah, 40 of those. Free BC, buoyancy compensator. Those run about 250 a pop. Yeah, probably 25 of those. Free custom wetsuit. 
Oh, easily 500 bucks. Plenty of those. Free regulator. Free dive certification class. Now, the difference there is uh, Butters wants to give free lessons. And for every 10 free lessons he gives, he might get two or three people to actually sign up for a certification class. Those run about 400 bucks. Yeah, there's 50 of those out there. So, <laughs> you know, stuff like uh, free certification class, free dive certification class for family of four. I mean, this could run easily 1500 bucks. Hell, 30 of those. Um, anyway, you get the idea. Jesus Christ. Two drunken degenerates, a Sharpie, 500 golf balls, and a darkly vindictive attitude. Man, what a good time. So now it's Thursday before the Saturday, and one of Tony's buddies reports that Butters suspects might, something might be cooking to disrupt his little shindig. Now he's got a pretty good idea who, but no idea what. And he was going to camp in his car down there Friday night and uh, wait to put his little boat in the bay on Saturday morning to spread his hunted golf balls around. So we had Janice drive her truck with uh, us in the bag down the park road a little after midnight or Saturday morning. And she slowed down, you know, on the north side of the bay. And just before Tony rolled out with his backpack full of golf balls, he grabbed my hand hard, hold me forward, looked me in the eye and in his best Sean Connery, we're embarking on a dangerous mission. If you get caught behind enemy lines, you're on your own, son. Head for the sea. And then he rolls off the tailgate and was gone. And then we cruise up another quarter mile, and I slide out on the south end. Now, you can see that south or, uh, Sunset Bay is a beautiful circular bay, where on the, the seaward side, uh, the outer rocky tips actually come together a bit to partially enclose and shelter the bay, shelter the bay making it a, a real popular spot to uh, swim, dive, paddleboard. I mean, there's a nice big beach area, public facilities. It's beautiful. So we're going to station ourselves on the outer tips. Tony on the north, me on the south. Now, I took the south because, well, I was younger and the, the south was going to be a much longer and tougher crawl through the rocks and the pitch black. And then we'll launch everything back in towards the bay where all the best dive areas were. And we had reason to believe that there was going to be two or three guys down there with butters overnight just to help him keep an eye on the area. And if one of us was caught, there wouldn't be any cops involved. There would be a pretty good chance, though, of a couple broken bones. I mean, seriously, we were fully intending to fuck with this man's livelihood and he knew something was coming. So this was serious war shit. And we started out around 1 a.m. Because we knew it was going to be a long, tough crawl to get out there at least two hours on the rocks and in the dark. And we're both outdoorsmen. I mean, we knew we could get there. It was just going to take some time. And I remember, as I was making my way around the south perimeter, you know, I'd look back towards the east where the parking lot and the restrooms were, and seeing this little flashlight walk around the restroom area. Hell, these dummies are guarding the beach in the parking lot. They have profoundly underestimated us. Oh, this is going to be good. So now I make it out to my post on the south tip. It's about 0330, still pitch black. I mean, there's some light surf breaking on the rocks around my feet. And I look to the east, and I see the enemy's flashlights, again, by the restrooms. They have no clue. We beat them. We are preparing to deliver irreparable damage to a very deserving individual. And it was easy. Revenge is a dish best served cold. There's no better feeling than that. Now it's time to start the launch sequence and send these little beauties on their way. Now, as soon, soon as I grabbed the first golf ball, standing out on the rocks in the dark with a light surf crashing at my feet, oh, man, it was romantic. The realization sinks in of what we've accomplished. We hatched a silly scheme of retribution on a truly deserving individual, planned out every step, and executed it to perfection. Hell, this was actual SEAL Team 6 bullshit.
But now, after that moment's reflection, it's time to dump these pills and get the fuck out of Dodge. I mean, we still have to get out of there. But no matter what happens now, the damage is done and can't be undone. Balls are out there. So I just start slinging pills in an arc back and forth inside the bay. Just throw, 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 throw. And let me tell you, it takes a surprising long time to uh, throw 250 golf balls. After about the first 100, my old football shoulder is really throbbing. Uh, but you don't slow down because now the anxiety's building. It's now around, uh, around 0430, and the skyline to the east is starting to get a little purple, which means in another 45 minutes, it's going to be light enough for an observant person to spot us. And getting caught by two guys with bats on the way out would be worse than going in because now you've already done what you came to do. It's too late. And at that point, it's just punishment. And I did not want to spend the next five months in a cast or have my knees reconstructed. When you go after a man's livelihood, there are big boy consequences and nobody out there is calling a cop. So I finally get down to my last 30 or so and I start to hear this little splink, splink, splink in the water in front of me. That goddamn Tony's throwing balls at me now. So now I've got the adrenaline rush giggles. I'm giggling and laughing, just uncontrollably, slinging pills at Tony. He's laughing, throwing them back. And then as if on cue, we're both out of golf balls and just standing there looking at each other. Yeah, looking at each other. It was still dark, but now I could see a man-shaped silhouette standing on a dark rock across the, the bay opening from me, which means if the dummies in the parking lot were looking towards the ocean, they'd see us pretty clear, silhouetted against the, the horizon. It was time to go. Now. We stood straight. We stood up straight, gave each other a formal salute across the bay, and faded into the darkness. Now, making the way back was, was a little easier. I mean, it had a little bit of light, and I wasn't toting 30 pounds of golf balls. And I guess the little rascals were too busy guarding their thermos than to worry about a couple mercenaries like us. If I made it back to my pickup point, a little after uh, 0600, and right on cue, about 6.30, Janice drives up slow, and I jump in the truck. And uh, Tony's already there working on his second beer, shoves one in my lap. So now what do you do? After a successful black ops operation behind enemy lines, why, you celebrate a Waffle House, of course. <laughs> In the 30 minutes it took to get uh, from the park to Waffle House, I mean, we, we'd already cracked our third six-pack. Man, we were so damn proud of ourselves, coming up with a workable plan, getting the golf balls, slipping past the sentries that knew we were coming, and making a clean escape. In and out, no muss, no fuss. Oh, uh, Marchinko would have been proud. Anyway, we spend the rest of the morning just hooting and laughing, celebrating at Waffle House. So now we knew from all the radio spots that had been running all week that there'd be free, you know, soft drinks, uh, hot dogs, games for the kids. Butters was, uh, you know, again, putting himself out there. And the prize divers would be turned loose uh, when they waved the flag at noon. So we rolled back in there about 1130 to watch the show. And the parking lot was packed. We parked out on the road walk to the beach, and there must be, oh, 250 people, or I mean 150 to 200 people all spread out there with blankets on the beach, dogs running, kids throwing frisbees. I mean, the whole scene was just oozing with wholesome Americana. Just made you proud to be an American, by God. NASCAR, Cheese Whiz, and PBR. <laughs> now, Tony and I saunter down to the beach, where Butter has his table set up, you know, signing up uh, treasure divers, talking to the radio and newspaper folks, just being the master ceremonies. I mean, it was his day, after all. I'm sticking pretty close to Tony, watching his back. I mean, seriously, watching his back. Because when the first guy pops up out of the water with a custom wetsuit in his hand, Butters is going to know that he's ruined. And there's no telling what he and his friends are going to do at that point. And I spot two guys that are watching us pretty hard, so I'm watching them watch us while uh, Tony and Butters exchange their little pleasantries. 
Ah, good turnout, Butters. Must have cost you a dollar. Yeah, and with all these new classes, I'm thinking about expanding. I might even open a little shop in Charleston. You never know. Yep, you never know, do ya? <laughs> then we walk down the beach a little where, you know, Janice has lawn chairs set up. We crack another beer and settle in for the show. Now, there's probably, oh, I don't know, 50 uh, people or so who'd actually signed up for the treasure hunt, which, you know, was going to be a nice little mailing list for butters. And at noon, the whistle blows, they wave the flag, and like a big herd of turtles, off they go, waddling down the beach. Now, the, the bay's pretty good size, so it takes a few minutes to work your, out, or work your way out to where the, the dive areas are, where the prizes are. And in no time, the first snorkeler comes walking up the beach, looking all happy with a double handful of golf balls. And right behind him is another one. Butter's head shoots up. See these guys coming with all these balls in no time? Shoots a murderous look over at Tony and me with eyes the size of dinner plates. And then you could see the air just went out of him. His face and shoulders visibly sagged. At that moment, Butters knew he had been fucked. He was ruined. There's no escape in this. With the prizes on the tables and more coming up the beach, now the newspaper and the radio folks are there. You know, there's a little crowd watching the excitement. You know, people getting involved. Mayor Raccoon's Bay, where Butter's shop is located, is there. Free mask and snorkel. Free buoyancy compensator. Free custom wetsuit. Two certification classes for families of four. Free equipment rental for family of four for a year. And it goes on and on and on. And I have to give Butters credit because I honestly don't know what I would have done in that situation. I think I would have just snapped and wanted bloodshed right, from, right there in front of God and everybody. But he sat there all afternoon, going through the motions, logging every prize under every name who signed up, knowing full well that not one of these people was getting a damn thing. There must have been $20,000 worth of prizes logged that in no way could he honor. He knew he was down in Coos Bay, and he was going to have to move up the coast and start over. Within a few days, people started showing up at his dive shop to get fitted for their new custom wetsuit and sign up for their free certification classes. And then, of course, major shit hits the fan. Butters actually tried to claim that he'd been sabotaged and uh, would only offer uh, the original intro lessons and discounts to everybody, but that went over like a wet fart in church. In about 30 days or so, he was closed. And... Uh, Word was he'd opened up a new shop up around Tillamook somewhere. Don't know. Don't care. But as time passed, I'd, I'd think a lot about what we did. Not with regret. Butters was just one of those guys who had had one coming to him for a while. But as a life lesson that I carry to this day, 46 years later. And that is you need to take a real deep breath. Then be very careful and circumspect with who you decide to escalate a conflict with. I mean, you have no real idea who that person is or what he's capable of. And you just might run into a couple old mercenaries who will derive much enjoyment from fucking your life up forever. And that's how we took care of business. In the Great Sunset Bay Golf Ball Catastrophe of 1979. <laughs> now, if you've made it this far and enjoyed it at all, uh, please consider subscribing. It's just a click, and it means a lot to see it. And hit the notification bell for the next one. After four years in the Coast Guard and about 14 more in the Merchant Marines, uh, I have been fortunate in my travels and have been in some sort of mischief and, you know, a lot of seaports, a lot of sailor bars in a lot of countries around the world and after decades of urging from family and friends 
it's uh, time to start logging a few of my more interesting uh, exploits before they're just lost to senility. So please come along and help spread the bullshit. And with that, thanks for tending. Meetings adjourned.